what, what we're going to do is give you an update on what we've been doing. We're the, we do remote sensing, but we're also the boots for sometimes boats on the ground geologists working on various aspects of the SAM from shoreline change down to monitoring short-term response to shoreline during and after storms. So we're going to give you just an overview of a few of the things we're working on right now, uh, John and myself and Rob, who's hiding in the back right now. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about tonight is three things. One is the update to the shoreline change maps. How many people have ever seen the previous shoreline change maps? How many of you work in something where you use them? Yeah, almost all of the same people. Oh, we use them for work, so we knew about them. There are actually a great set of shoreline change maps done statewide uh, in 2007. They've actually been on the CRMC website since 2007. Most people were not aware they were there. We're hoping to change that, and we're updating them up to 2014. Uh, right now, focusing on Washington County, uh, including Block Island. <coughs> that's all new. We'll get to that in a second and slowly creeping into some other towns as we, as we go. Uh, we're also gonna be working, as people have mentioned, to this idea of projecting that shoreline change from the historic rates into the future. Uh, now we understand paradigms are shifting, we're gonna have sea level rise in the next century, beyond if you've read some of the recent articles on that. Regardless, we still have storms, and storms ultimately still drive shoreline change, so we're gonna use the past rates to project where we think the shoreline may be in the future. Uh, and we continue to monitor shorelines, uh, the shoreline at various places around the state. Again, we're the boots on the ground geologists. So we do this in a lot of areas along the south coast uh, and Block Island. I'm just going to tell you about two of the newer projects that have started uh, about coincident with the time of the same. So when we do shoreline change mapping, what we do is we use what we call the last high tide swash, or the wet dry line, or the rack line, whatever your, your parlance is, we use LHTS. Why do we use that? It's Visible, not always readily, but visible in aerial photography. You can see it on the ground, so you can also walk that with a GPS. Uh, and it's, we think, the best proxy we have for where high tide is. Now, it's not perfectly lining up the elevation of high tide. We have waves. Uh, we've done work on that. A previous colleague, Scott Rasmussen, looked at that. Basically, the high tide lines are slightly above feet higher high water. But it's a good proxy. Better than using vegetation. It's better than using anything else like that. And we think it's better than using elevation, which you derive from LIDAR. That's very useful when you're comparing LIDAR to LIDAR, but to compare LIDAR to an aerial uh, photograph, you've got to do a lot of, you have to use a lot of assumptions of beach slope, wave height, wave energy, tidal range, and a whole lot of things. The USGS calls a proxy data bias correction. That's a mouthful to say, a lot of assumptions. So we like to compare apples to apples, so we use last night's type of squash. What we do is draw these high tide lines on aerial photography. That's vertical aerials from historic time. And I'll try to stand up here so I'm not in everybody's way of the map. Uh, and digital ortho photos in more recent years. And so we have a number of shorelines projected on here. The updated <coughs> maps we'll be using uh, 1939, which is in red, 1951, some photographs were in 1952 in black, 1963 in this purple, green is 2012. Those who use the 2012 imagery will note that's because they were the eelgrass photos to the shoreline screen. We thought that was cute. <laughs> and blue 2014 USGS photographs. This is Charleston Breachway. This is the state parking lot and the campground that they will booth right there. And so what you can actually notice here is, if you're an astute observer, you said, wait a minute, you said red was 1938, uh, 39. Why is that more landward than 1950? One, well, of course, we did have a big hurricane in 38. Uh, we also have uh, construction of jetties at the breachway. So the shoreline didn't go back consistently through time. There's a couple of periods in the 50s and 60s where either the 1963 or 1951 is further out, more seaward, more depositional than the 1939. Why is that important? Well, the last round of mapping used what we call net shoreline movement. If I wanted to measure shoreline change on this line in the previous maps, we went from the oldest to the youngest. And that's not really capturing the whole story here. And so what we've done in this updated map is we're using the most landward position, in this case 2014, and the most seaward position, in this case 1950. It doesn't change it dramatically in some places. In some places it is a big shift. And so here the shoreline is further out in 1951. That means the shoreline has changed more 
And we do produce a shoreline change rate um, begrudgingly. We, we recognize we need to for setback purposes. The reason we say begrudgingly is the shoreline doesn't retreat in a very systematic way. It jumps during storm events, particularly, as we saw at Sandy, on low-lying headlands and on barriers where they were allowed to overwash. Uh, we saw the shoreline step back during Sandy. So we put a rate in there, averaging it out over time, recognizing the shoreline doesn't really respond exactly like that. And so on all of these maps, we have a lot of information. We have our baseline and our transect that we use to measure the shoreline change. These two gray lines here. We have all of our various shorelines and colored lines. We have a transect ID number for each of these. And then we have two different boxes, one black, one white. The black box is the total amount of change. How much has the shoreline position actually changed? And then the rate divided by that number of years. It's all done within GIS and remote sensing, but it provides a rate every 50 meters along the shoreline. So it's another improvement on the old maps. We decrease the spacing. So you can get closer to having an actual measured rate in front of your property. We provide a big, uh, nice, clean explanation. We're big believers in your data is only good as how you present it, a lesson you learned well when you're a John's graduate student. Uh, but we can have these nice, clean legends, and you can take a look at the full map over John's shoulder uh, after the meeting. We're also working on creating maps for Block Island. Block Island was not done in the previous round of mapping. Uh, it's very difficult to actually georeference photographs on Block Island. It has changed dramatically in the last few decades. There are not a lot of uh, landmarks that are all the same. Uh, so we're stuck right now with two, two sets of, uh, sh two shoreline positions. We've got a nice set of georeference 1952 images. So this red line was digitized the 1952 aerial photograph. And this blue line is actually one we walked with a very accurate handheld GPS, accurate to about this. Um, some students and I uh, walked the entire perimeter of the island in June of 2013, and that's what that blue line represents. This is, of course, the infamous um, landfill line to Block Island. Here's the transfer station today. And so you can see the same format here. The shoreline is retreated here, 40 meters, 39 meters, at a rate of about two thirds of a meter per year. Still retreating into the map today, but that's a separate issue. Brian pointed out uh, the, the maps have been up on at CRMC. They've actually been in the red books since 1985. There's a 1985 version in the red book. But then they migrated to the CRMC website because it became digital in 2007. Only I've talked to people, lots of people who should know better, who don't know better, and they can't find them. Oh, well, it's doing that something. So this is uh, an attempt to make them more uh, open so people can find them. And so anyway, so they, so they, again, they, they are on the shoreline, on the beach stamp homepage, under resources and tools below, storm tools. We kind of have it all capitalized in that storm. <laughs> Anyway, shoreline change maps, next. You click on that, you get this, you get this front page right here. And so what this is, is that all of the ones in the state that exist now, and the ones that are gonna be upgraded are only gonna be mostly in Washington County, so we're not doing the whole, the whole state at this time. We had hopes. But anyway, here's an example map, and then there are explanations of what you see on the map, and that's what's written out right here. And so then, if you want to get to a larger version so you can get to where you want to be, you click on one of these boxes right here. So if you click on that box right there, you get to the Narragansett Bay shoreline change maps. And it will explain because <laughs> In 2003, 2004, which is the 2007 version, uh, we have different years for, for the bay than we do actually for the South Shore. And okay, so then if you want to look at the South Shore, which is well, the new ones that are coming, this is, you click on the next box, and you have South Shore and, and uh, Block Island. That's, that's, that'll be in the new ones. Uh, and so it's, uh, again, this is a description. And then we have this caution here. 
please know Coach Maloney will not occur solely over time with a constant rate. No such thing as chronic erosion, rather as a result of what changes due to storms. For that reason, the rates provided with insurance change that should be used with caution. But because it's a, uh, it's needed for, uh, 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 needed for the CRC needs to use it, so they do. Okay, so if you, if you pick out one of these, and this is the Narragansett Beach right here. And that's what Narragansett Beach looks like in the new maps. At 50 meters again, as, as Brian said, the this furthest outline is 1939, and the furthest inline is 2014. This is uh, the South Beach Pavilion right here. This is the South Beach parking lot. This is the end of the South Beach parking lot where you walk off the seawall uh, walk and walk onto the beach right here, right there at that location. And, and uh, if in case you want to see what a full, what a full blown map at the correct scale is, it's right here behind me. I'll point you. There it is. Um, and um, so you notice here that right here at the end of the parking lot, the erosion rate is, uh, the, the erosion, the total amount of road is about 100 feet. But as you get right up here in the middle, this is really interesting. It's something that came up in the mapping. The change is very small, 30 feet. So, so there's a lot of sediment going by. It's bypassing and it's going over to the mouth of the river. But that's a story for another day. So I'll give it back to Brian. So these maps, these maps are, being, are available right now. The 2003-2004 and, and 2014s will be available in September. But you can get to them uh, on the on the BSAMP website. Okay, go. So in addition to the shoreline change mapping, we are looking ahead. There's not much to show you on this yet. I did uh, pull up one small piece of this idea of projected shoreline change to show you one of the areas that is uh, at significant risk from erosion. And then we'll talk about our monitoring that we do, again, the kind of boots on the ground work. So this idea of projected shoreline change, it's, it's been around for a while. There's various modeling approaches. But if you comb through the literature, it turns out um, simple usually works pretty well in this case. Uh, and whatever model you want to use, you get pretty good results by projecting the historic rates of shoreline change into the future. So what you see on this figure is in the tunic. Here's one of the carpenters. This is the pavilion at South Kingston Town Beach, the trailer park here, Tunic Beach Road, going down to the infamous sheet pile of wreck, the soon to be sheet pile of wreck. And in here, this is the black line, that's the 1951 shoreline. The gray are our transects where we measure the shoreline position. Blue is 2014. Now what we've highlighted in red is we actually take that change that we measure between 51 and basically today. We come up with that annual rate. We actually add some uncertainty to that and based on our accuracy of our position because this is viewed as a planning tool. We want to be more aggressive and show the range as well as we can. Uh, it turns out that only changes it by a couple of meters. It's on the ground, not really a big addition. Uh, but this red envelope is essentially where we think the shoreline will be in 2050. That's 36 years from, from today, or from 2014. Uh, they did move this pavilion back. It's now about here, right on the edge. But you see a number of properties that were in carpenters. And you see this getting very close to the tuna feature of here, and of course here. Now, the sheet pile of Edmund will fix that problem there. Uh, but the question, slightly funny, uh, will be what happens to things like this for that. And that's something we'll be exploring with the projected shoreline change. Uh, this has measured the erosion up to this structure. Uh, this rate assumes that venting has failed and erosion will continue. And it is important to note, we did see failure of the, the protection structure down at this end during um, sand. So there'll be more to come on this as we go through the winter and continue to work on it. Uh, probably next spring we'll have some materials we shall have on things for this next spring when it's done with PSM stuff. That's all remote sensing. That's all in the lab working with GIS. We're also uh, field geologists. We spend a lot of time in the field. And one of our really common techniques we use as coastal scientists is what we call beach profiling. It's a way of taking a topographic profile of the shoreline, starting from a known location, uh, using two sticks and a string, also called the modified Emory method. Uh, 
Uh, and there's two of my students on a very chilly gray day in early June of 2013. Uh, we were out there working on the shoreline position. We got this last weather day and said, well, we're stuck waiting for the ferry until this time to go on, the, put the truck on the ferry and come home. Let's go do some beach profiles. And so we set up four, we've added some more. And so we measure eight profiles on Block Island starting again in the summer of 2013. Uh, now with largely volunteers. Um, we call them the Block Island Beach Profile crew. Nigel, who's a world famous retired biochemist from Yale, his wife Kathy, also no slouch, she's another PhD biochemist. They retired to Block Island um, and they spend their time now being citizen, they don't really citizens anymore, but super citizen scientists, whether it's doing beach profiles or doing uh, bird studies with nature conservancy. Judy uh, Gray, she was a meteorologist at NOAA and her partner Jules, who is also in NOAA, is not in the picture. But they go out once a month and take profiles from these eight locations. They send me the data. Uh, I have students enter the data and we archive it and, and interpret the changes that we may notice. Uh, and you can see Judy <laughs> demonstrating a very good form there on the uh, profile of Charleston Beach. This gives us data that looks something like this. These cross sections, this is elevation above mean lower low water. This is distance and this is two profiles from January beginning and end of the month. This is essentially the February profile, so to speak. They go for the lowest low tide of the month um, when they go out to do the profiles. And we actually tie up the telephone poles even though they actually profile from this sign the rest of the time. So they go up and over the forenoon. And you can see over this month, uh, there had been a small storm in December in this fairly flat beach profile. And the sediment from down here in the lower, uh, more erosional berm is actually more construction over the month of January. There is no winter summer beach, it's storm driven. In this case, this was significant recovery during a period of fair weather in January 15th. We're also applying that same technique to Squamish and State Beach. If you remember, remember they put 100,000 just about yards of sand on Squamish and State Beach last year. It cost them $3.1 million, all trucked in from Bradford uh, with dump trucks. So we decided to go out and monitor the fate of that sediment. And so we had already set up one profile here the previous year to capture some pre-conditions. Uh, and then we went out and added one, two, four, and five to the mix. So we have now five profiles we measure monthly. We also use uh, differential GPS, largely done by Janet Friedman, to measure the position of that high tide line monthly. And RTK GPS to make surfaces or 3D models of the beach. We do that quarterly. So we have a pretty good look at the beach. And it turns out some profiles, this is five, haven't changed all that much. The red line is literally the day they left the beach. I have a great picture of my student walking down the beach with the GPS as the last dump truck's pulling off. So this was the last possible day we could have, the first day we could have actually been there. And not much changed. This is April of 2015. So at that profile, they've lost about three cubic meters. Not, not all that much. The middle profile on that side, the fourth one, well, um, that's basically back to where they started. Uh, why these two profiles, this stretch of the shoreline was so erosional, uh, we're still working on why that is. We have some kind of working hypotheses, but uh, both of these two profiles are essentially back to the starting configuration. <coughs> this end, this end, doing okay still. Why? We'll, we'll figure that out. But this is an important study because beach replenishment is kind of seen as the panacea of a lot of other parts of the country, New Jersey, uh, New York in particular, Massachusetts in some areas. And we're going to continue to look at this as a solution. It's important to understand the actual uh, effect, of, <laughs> how effective it actually is, the word I'm looking for, um, in the long term. We also couple that with some other higher tech toys. This is an RTK GPS. It gives us position and elevation down to a couple of centimeters. When it's not beach season, we take Rover's uh, fancy ATV from CRMC, we put the GPS on there, we drive up and down the beach like we're cutting the grass. We get points very effectively, although it's very cold in the wintertime. Uh, in the summertime, it's beach season, we really can't do that. People are on the beach, so we came up with this nice idea of, uh, we put it on my wife's jogging stroller, and we walk up and down the beach. Uh, my students do more of the walking than I do, but we can actually, this is actually pretty effective. This is much more efficient, but in a six hour day, we can get a lot of points. That's what that first survey looked like in May of 2014, about 9,000 data points or something like that. We can take that, interpolate it into a nice surface, and this is elevation. 
uh, up to almost five meters above mean low and low water. And the cool part is when we have multiple years or multiple surveys we've done, we can subtract the two of them. And so the red now is the change in elevation. Notice not much change here, not much change far end here, lots of change right here. They've lost, in this case, this is done right up until April of 2015, a couple of meters of meters. So this is basically back to mean low and low water here. The firm crest is back here somewhere. So we can track this a number of different ways. Uh, I try to be pretty good about putting the, the monitoring work up on my website. Uh, you can check that link there. You can get it, the shoreline change maps through beachsamp.org, or just email us and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction. And with that, I think we're going to turn it over to James Boyd from Sarah's. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. Uh, Does anybody have any questions? Oh. I have a question. Um, isn't the area down by Point Judith, where there's like the Harbor of Refuge, where there's those barriers down there, mm -hmm. have they ever made any significant uh, significance in the difference in the change of the coast right there? Do those barriers do anything? Yeah, the erosion rates are generally lower in the Harbor Refuge than we see adjacent to it. But it's really complicated in there because where they had erosion issues, they still have them. They put a number of groins in, in the whatever, 60s and 70s, I think those groins went in. And that has complicated that. So some areas see very little change. Some areas, because of the groins just downstream, have seen a lot of change. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated answer. So it's slightly less, but complicated. Has anybody ever looked at whether those jetties from the time they were installed have contributed to the erosion or caused the erosion? Inside the harbor or? No, no, further down. Actually, the question, her question reminded me of 